got tall boots and memories to hold. And when the sun finally sets, I can see my cigarettes burning slow, just like the songs on the radio. Young man. Good morning. What's going on, everyone? We got T. Miller, Kyle, not Mr. Moon, on uh, the Periscope. Whole crew on YouTube already. Steve B., Kyle, Jill, William, Norm, no name, Josh. Don't forget the intro, Osborne. This is morning. A little, little coffee, a little baseball, some books. Maybe some movies every now and then, documentaries usually. Uh, American towns, American history, everything I like. Look how sweaty this hat's getting, not Mr. Moon. Not Mr. Moon gave me this tourist hat. I wore it to the beach yesterday or last weekend. It's getting so sweaty. I have another one. Not Mr. Moon is the real deal. He sent me a backup. He's like, you can't lose the tourist hat. Everyone calls themselves the tourist now, huh? Um. The, the YouTube chat confused the hell out of me because you guys were acting like I was doing it at a different time than usual. But don't I always do it at 9 a.m.? You really you really tricked me. 27 minutes early. Do I usually do it at 9.30? I thought I usually do it at 9 o'clock. Is it because of technical difficulties that brought me to 9.30? Anyway, welcome to the morning show. What's going on, everybody? My name is Jimmy, and this is a show where I talk about all my interests in little bite-sized bits. First up, tell you what just dropped on talking uh, on, on John Boy Media today, and Facebook didn't work today. So, sorry to everyone that usually watches on Facebook, which actually a ton of people. I think it's the most watched. I think it's our most watched platform now um, out of all three, which is crazy. But Talking Yanks is coming out today. We did um, a voicemail episode Talking Yanks is getting so fun. I'm getting giddy. We did the pregame show yesterday. Just getting so giddy about it. Laughs from the Past came out today. We're in a season nine of Laughs from the Past, and it's all heists, which are awesome. Like, we've done two so far, and both times it's like, uh, these are awesome stories. Why don't they make these movies as I burp into the mic? This one was about the Great Gold Robbery in 1855 in England. They made a movie about it called The Great Train Robbery with Sean Connery. Just a awesome heist. Like a really, really well-planned heist that um, that gets... Well, the ending sucks because it was such a good heist. No one should have ever found out about it, but they did. So go check that out. What we're listening to... Oh, I have the wrong logo in there for Talking Folk. But Talking Folk came out today. I'm in the middle of the episode right now. It's all about Jason Isbell's album, Reunions. He had Ryan and John on there to talk about three songs. I am a huge Isbell guy. I wanted to listen. I wanted to play Isbell today on the show. But we had the Wild Feathers uh, and this song, Tall Boots, like, queued up in, in the logo already. So I didn't switch it out. So maybe I'll switch tomorrow for Isbell. Love Jason Isbell. And it's getting so hot. And Dreamsicle is all about a summer night, so it feels like the perfect song. Um, I probably should have done that instead. But anyway, uh, John Boy Jake Radio, we're back today. Tuesday shows are always fun because we have four days where we haven't talked about anything, so there's a lot to catch up on. And Pinstripe Strong, Joe's and the boys, Joe's, Chris, and uh, Keith, the McFly gang, they put out an episode. This is what it's titled, Besting Your Worst. Oh, Jerry Harrison Jr. guest spot. No, no, that's just com- that's from March. We got to reorganize the way this comes up in the podcast app. Anyway, that's everything that's coming out today. Boom. This show cures insomnia. Thanks. Does that mean I put you to sleep? That's cool. That's cool. 
I mean, I, I listen to shows to fall asleep to all the time, so there's a, there's a great benefit in that. Ah, oh, you guys ever listen to those sleep podcasts? There's one sleep podcast. I tried to listen to it because I, I need noise to put myself to sleep because if you put me in a bed in a silent room, my brain will just think myself into a depression like that. So there's all these sleep podcasts. There's this one. My, my uh, fiancé likes one. But there's this one, and my God, it pisses me off. And it's just a personal thing because he talks in broken sentences and run on sentences and my brain, I'm like, get to the fucking point so I can fall asleep already. But I think you're supposed to fall asleep while he's getting to the point. Anyway, um, you can use this to fall asleep if you want. That's great. I'm not going to fall asleep because I got a fucking nice mug of cold brew that I brewed myself. So there you go. Uh, All right. There's so much stuff going on today that I'm excited about. One, the random town of the day was Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, which is famous for the, uh, the uh, and we're going to get to Fielder Jones. For people that are just coming in, we're going to get to Fielder Jones. His story's awesome. I was just reading his biography like last night and this morning, and it's awesome. But first, got to do the weather in the town. It's 84 degrees. There's isolated thunderstorms in Punxsutawney. Do you know how Punxsutawney got its name? Well, no one really does because there's about a 20 million stories. I feel like every... Town name that comes from Native Americans, they just they just did like backwards etymology. They're like, well, okay, it could be this, and then they made up a legend for that. So here's some legends: Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, was known for their gnats, just swarms of gnats. Cleveland, Ohio, 2008, October fifth. I don't know what what day the Java game was. Just gnats. So people tried to settle there, and the gnats swarmed them off. The Indians tried to settle. Native Americans, I apologize. Tried to settle there. Natives, I apologize. I don't know. Tried to settle there, and they swarmed them off. All right? There was clouds of biting gnats. They eventually drove everyone away. The Indians, that's what this thing says. Whatever. They called the insects punkies, which was living dust and ashes. And they called their village punkus utinink. Punkus utinink. Land of the Ponkies. So they think maybe that became Punxsutawney. Another legend has it that the origin of the term Ponkies, which means dust, bugs, uh, uh, was an old native uh, sorcerer slash hermit, which those go hand in hand. If you're a sor- sorcerer, you're, re- you're going to be, you know, by yourself a lot because people are scared of you. So, you know, that sucks for you. But he was a sorcerer and a hermit, and he was said to have long terrorized Indians in the region. Eventually he was killed, his body was burned, and his ashes were cast to the wind. According to the story, the ashes transformed into bugs that infested the land. And that was him coming back to beat them. Pretty cool. People didn't like you so much that they thought you came back as bugs to bother them. Another story about the source of the term asserted that the in native natives compared the insect bites to burns caused by sparks or hot ashes. There's always one. There was always one when they give these, you know, what does, what's the town we did um, a couple weeks ago where the, the uh, natives, there was the legend of they all killed themselves. They, the, they fought for the daughter and there was, you know, how the name was born. He screamed out. Oh, it was so funny. Kara. He screamed out the names like Kara Pati. Oh, I forget what it was. Um, and then there's always one version, like, and some believe it was this. It's like, well, that makes a lot of sense. Gnats do feel like little burns of hot ashes getting bit by something. Like, that makes sense. Why don't you just do that? So that's how Punxsutawney, Pennsylvania, got its name. But I really wanted to know, and maybe I should have done this, like, on Groundhog's Day. I wanted to know how, how the fuck did Groundhog's Day and, like, Phil become. I, I'd never really tuned in for it. I think it happens way too early in the morning for me, but I have I have a like a one minute history and it's kind of made me like it. Check this out. Well, it was actually started by the editor of the Punk's Toy Spirit a newspaper back in 1886. They were originally Groundhog Hunters, but they dubbed themselves the Groundhog Club, and he was actually a member of that club. Another one of my theories. I think that uh, they were on a Groundhog Day one a hunt one day. A groundhog comes walking out, and I like to think there was an aura 
about them. And that they recognized that this groundhog was special. He started uh, documenting it every year. And of course his club, you know, kind of got into it and they started getting the townspeople into it. And seeing there was just people gathering to, you know, see this groundhog. I'm speaking for myself, but it would be really hard for me to pull the wall. All right, so I didn't know that the groundhog and Punxsutawney Phil was just an old dude's club. Like him and five buddies went hunting for groundhogs all the time, and then they called themselves the Groundhog Club. So we got like basically the elder adult version of the Babysitter's Club, right? And then that becomes they have so much fun with it. They're like, oh, let's get this groundhog to see its shadow, which that shit, the shadow stuff comes from hedgehogs in Germany. And they're like, we can do that too. And then, and then, uh, their club became so famous that now the whole country tunes in if the stupid thing sees its shadow. I mean, talk about an upstart club. At one point, these old men were like, I wish it was still the good old days and just the 10 of us and this groundhog. Got too big for them. Now it's a whole economy. That's how the Groundhog Day punks a tiny fill. Did you see the one shot of, like, the groundhog in a jar? And the whole crowd just looking at it? Seems incredibly fucked up. Look at that. That doesn't seem, like, cool, you know? I mean, that's just a groundhog. That's just a trapped animal. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you won't you won't confuse me for an animal animal activist many times, but this picture kind of just seems like an uh, animal in a jar, and everyone's staring at, it and the animal probably scared to death. I don't know, really weird, but yeah, groundhog. Someone in the in the YouTube chat said, uh, "Well, they're, you guys are talking too fast. You guys are." Too many things. I missed it. Um, someone said it was just an excuse to drink whiskey outside in the cold. Like, yeah, we're going to go hunt groundhogs. Probably. Probably was like, yeah. If a groundhog happened to walk on by, they're like, great. Bam. Boom. You're done. We got gotcha. you. You see your shadow? Doesn't a groundhog piss on the handler every year? Anyway, that's Punks to Tawny, Pennsylvania. That's uh, the groundhog. I'm not. Oh, wrong button, dumbass. And that's all I have to say about that. Fielder June. Fielder Jones. Let's talk about him. Let's talk about the man. This was a suggestion from Josh. Don't forget the intro. Osborne, who's in the chat every day. Appreciate you, Josh. He suggested Fielder Jones. And look at this hardened man. Look at that guy. Does that guy look like a guy that fought MLB and the league about contracts and the reserve clause and he wanted to be a free agent? He went down swinging. Actually, he didn't really go down swinging. He got he got tricked into not getting his way. But he fought diligently. All right, ready? I'm going to I'm going to run through some Fielder Jones stuff because Josh, great suggestion. His real name was Fielder. It wasn't a nickname. Um, and according to uh, his family's archives, his descendants have traced all the way back to Robert the Bruce, King of Scotland in the 1300s. How's that work? His mother's family was traced to the captain of the Mayflower. Seems like they, you know, it's too, it's too good for me to be true. The parents named him after great uncle Fielder Jones, a Civil War general. So there you go. He's got greatness in his blood. Uh, in 1906, in the Saturday Evening Post, Fielder Jones would call the reserve clause the yoke of tyranny. The yoke of tyranny. I mean, the reserve clause lasted for so long. Who's the... Who's the guy that... Um, oh, God damn it. Garrett Cole thanked him. I'm blanking on his name. Uh... God, I'm pissing myself off. Who was the player back in the 70s that challenged the reserve clause? Gonna piss my off. Someone in the chat, drop his name. I can't move on till I remember it. 
Something very 60s sounding name, I feel like. Kurt Flood. Bam. Remembered it, a.k.a. went to Wikipedia and found it. So anyway, Kurt Flood was all about challenging the reserve clause in 1972. 1972, Fielder Jones was doing the same thing in 1904. It's nuts. So, um, I mean, he was pretty good. Fielder Jones was pretty good. Played a lot. I don't even want to, like, talk about that. He didn't want – he wanted – to do business stuff. Like he wanted to quit baseball and make money. He had a, he had a store in, uh, like I think, um, in New York, not city though, uptown, uh, way uptown, upstate, uh, upstate New York. And he was playing for the Cubs. And then when the American league was like, Hey, we're a real league too. We're a pro league. They went, they recruited him. The dude took like a boat. Another player that was recruiting people took a boat. So he went to the white Sox from the Cubs play for Comiskey but he hated the reserve clause. He didn't want to go there. He wanted to go back to New York. So um, he uh, hired an attorney to write his contract with the White Sox when he moved over to the AL. His contract did not contain a reserve clause. So he signed a three-year deal to play for the Giants starting in 1904, and he ha- hired his own lawyer and didn't have a reserve clause. So he was like, fuck that. After these three years, I want to go back to New York. I want to choose where I want to play. Um, he did have a comment, which he said, uh, I am, he said, and I quote, I am practically a slave. The baseball slave accepts the restrictions placed upon him by the great magnets and smiles. So that's what he said. Um, but yeah, so then what was happening was the American league was stealing so many players from the national league and the national league was stealing so many players from the American league and they were just driving up prices against themselves. So obviously the two rich people that own both leagues and were, you know, in both leagues were like, Hey, this is dumb. Why don't we just band together and drive their prices down? So they did. And one of the things they did was Comiskey made sure he could not leave his contract. And he signed after his contract was up, he signed another one with the giants. But Comiskey was like, don't honor that. He's not going to New York. I can't let him leave Chicago. Everyone loves him here. Fielder Jones showed up to spring training in New York when he was on the White Sox. He's like, nah, a contract's a contract. We all agreed. I'm, I play for you now. And they were like, ah, we'd love to have you. But, like, Comiskey, you know, you play for the White Sox. So you just kind of kind of leave this spring training. And you're like, okay, damn. Um. So then he went back, and then Comiskey came up with this grand plan to keep him around. He made a manager. He, like, fired the other one, the manager beforehand, Callahan, who was the second baseman, and he made uh, Fielder Jones the manager. He didn't, Fielder Jones didn't talk to Comiskey at all. He hated ownership. He was fighting with them. And then once he became the manager, Comiskey knew he would have too much pride and want to win. So then they started talking again, and it worked. He stayed in, uh, stayed for the White Sox. Crazy story. He kind of didn't win. But he's known as one of the, he was one of the best managers of the time. Uh, as the White Sox manager, his char- his charges easily defeated a powerful Chicago Cubs team to win the World Series in 1906. In his era, he was regarded as one of the most intelligent field generals in the game. He was also when he was playing, he was an outfielder, and they they wanted to cut down on the offense, so they changed some rules, they changed the style of play. It went from averaging like six runs a game to four runs a game for each team or something like that. And when runs became at a premium in like the dead ball error, everyone was stealing, everyone was taking the extra base, everyone was running. So Fielder Jones was just gunning dudes down. He threw out 20 people in one season in 1901, and then the next season he threw out 25. He led the AL with out, uh, double plays from the outfield. It was just a fielder through and through. Boom, not you really tell a true. bad joke every episode. <laughs> so that's Fielder Jones. Good suggestion by uh, Osborne. Don't forget the intro, Osborne. I wrote a bunch of stuff down. I was reading it and I was very interested in it. I didn't finish it, though, because I had to start the show. So there, if you want to go read the rest of his bio, I don't know how it ends. I don't know how the Fielder Jones story ends. I mean, when you look at some of his stats, usually I do that. Forgot to do that. Pretty dumb. Uh, he's buried in Portland, Oregon, so it, it looks like it ended on April 18th, 1896. No, that's when he debuted. My 
Apologies. 1934, he passed away. 60 something. 63. Um, yeah, it was pretty good. Long career. And then he went to the Federal League. Oh, you know what I did? I searched this on Twitter. There's flood stuff. Sometimes I search on Twitter to see if anyone's got any pictures of Fielder Jones. There's me. All right. There's Fielder Jones. Got him. There's another famous picture. It seemed like all the old, this one, all the old baseball accounts just post this one a lot. Bam. For the White Sox. I love old, old baseball. The catchers rarely squatted. They just kind of stood the whole time. They pitched really high. And the breaking stuff must not have been that crazy because, you know, imagine trying to catch, you know, like a sunny gray curveball standing and then having to, like, bend down to your ankles to grab it. It's crazy. Also, when I was choosing his picture, it was tough. Dude took a lot of good pictures. Like, this is the one I chose. Um, Like, this one. Look how fucking... Sa- oh, oh, you guys can't see that. And people listening on the podcast app can't. I mean, look how sassy this dude was. So that's the picture we chose, right? You've seen that one. Look at this. Just so sassy. This looks like a guy that spent his whole career fighting ownership. And then ownership sent a photographer and was like, take a picture, our star player, Fielder Jones. And you're like, go fuck yourself, dude. I hate you. Look at this. Look at this sassy pose. Hold on. You guys, you guys got to see the full body shot of this picture. <laughs> Hold on. Hold on. It's coming. It just may be the sassiest pose by a baseball player in a picture ever. Need more like that. It's just like a, it's a power stance and also the complete opposite of a power stance all in one photo. It's phenomenal. Good job by Fielder Jones. Any other good pictures? Um, laying down a bunt, cartoon picture. No, not really. Is this him as an old man? No, someone else. Chicago player manager Fielder Jones leads his punchless White Sox by example, laying down a bunt in an attempt to reach base safely. What do they mean by punchless? They, they couldn't, couldn't hit? See the catcher standing up? It's weird. weirds me out every time. This didn't squat back then. Also, watch your hands, Fielder. Oh, the ball's on the dirt? I don't know if you can see that. He bunted it straight down by his foot. Maybe it was perfect. Maybe not. All right. We're done. We're done with Fielder Jones. We had fun. But we're done. And that's all I have to say about that. The last part of the show is when we do the book time. Books. Uh, Dunstable Ramsey in the chat says he had a famous great-grandson, Basketball Jones. You tell a bad joke every episode. (laughs) All right. Down and out on Murder Mile. So I did the the book Junkie the other day by William S. Burroughs. Um, And some people in the comments or DMs or people that reach out are like, yeah, I like that book. Some people were like, that's his only good book, which, which which I liked because it's the only book I've ever read by him. So it's like, all right, should I try other ones or no? This is kind of like a modern version of Junkie by Tony O'Neill. Tony O'Neill's got, he's like super easy to read. I hate the shape of his books. I think he's going for some uniqueness here, but come on. Although I kind of like it fits in the back pocket nice and the, the words are big. But th- this is, I mean, if you, if you want to read about a lifestyle that hopefully you never live, being a heroin addict, um, this is it. Like, read Junkie, and you'll get the 1960s version of it. You can read Herbert S. Selby and get, um, like, the 50s version of it. That's more like Quaaludes and um, Bennies. Um, this shit's, like, hard heroin. But it, it's a novel. It's about um, 
After exhausting their resources in the slums of Los Angeles, a junkie and his wife settle in London's Murder Mile, the city's most violent and criminally corrupt section. Preserving past failed treatments, persistent temptation, urban ennui, and his wife's ruinous death wish. Ennui. The nameless narrator fights to reclaim his life. In prose that could peel paint from a car, Tony O'Neill recreates the painfully comic, often tragic days of a recovering heroin addict. I think I'm getting real good at that voice. Whatever that damn voice is. In prose that could peel paint from a car. It's kind of a good, that's kind of a good, it's probably why they put it on the back cover. It's kind of a good description. You guys want to hear like, is this all based on a true story or is it fiction? I think this is a true story. I think he was a heroin addict because his other, his, a lot of his themes are that. Like, like, I've read a lot of these books by him. Digging the Vein, uh, Songs from the Shooting Gallery. That's a collection of poems. I guess those are the only three. This one and those two I've read. Um, yeah, but I believe it's, it, yeah, he's a survivor of heroin addiction, crack abuse rehab. Yeah, so it is a true story or, you know, based on true events. But, like, you want to see how crazy this is? Like, you know, if you want to, if you like gritty books, this book opens up with, the first time I met Susan, she overdosed on a combination of Valium and ecstasy at a friend's birthday party at a Motel 6 on Hollywood Boulevard. It's the opening line. My friend Sal and I dragged her blue face down, the, down to the 5 a.m. Hollywood streets below, and the filthy pre-dawn drizzle on her face somehow brought her around. Like, it's like you're in there. So I like learning. I like reading about um, lifestyles that I never want to do and um, th- getting in the mind of people that I'll never, I'll never have that mindset. But it's cool. It was a really quick read, so go check that out if you want. He's got a book of poems, too, but I can't read those. I can't read those. They're, like, crazy. It's kind of like that. Um, all right. Uh, Kyle is suggesting something on the Periscope chat. I'd like to suggest William T. Volman. All right. Someone else suggested someone the other day. Um, Rob suggested novels in three lines by Finon. I still got it, Rob. I didn't fall. I didn't I'm fall. I didn't forget. I wrote it down. Um, let's see. So this is William T. Volman. Two N's, two L's. Rainbow Stories. And Russy Dubs in Periscope said The Fall of Princes. Okay, you guys are going to kill me with all these book recommendations. I just bought three. I haven't read it. Still got to finish the fucking Rebel Yell one, which is interesting, but so long. All right. And that's all I have to say about that. I don't know how long I've been going. Looks like 28 minutes. So two minutes of Q&A. I saw a lot of people talking about, ah, shit, I wanted to do this at the beginning of the episode. I forgot. I'm pretty unstructured here, as you all know. But uh, for everyone that watches on YouTube, which is a good chunk of people, and the chat on YouTube is very active, it's like one of the best and nicest communities. So I really like uh, reading along with you and interacting with you. The This uh, show will be going on a new YouTube. I just sent it in the chat there. Uh, as Jake's morning show will be going on the main channel. Mine will be going on the morning show channel. We can do a lot more stuff when we have uh, our own channel. And uh, breakdowns are, spo- are going to ramp back up. And I, I already gave the spiel on why we're doing this on last Friday's episode. I got two. Br- I got three breakdowns edited and ready to go today. Well, one is scheduled because it's a DraftKings breakdown. And then two from the Yankees games last night that I edited, but I didn't have a mic at my apartment last night. So I have them edited. So after this, I'm just going to lay it down. Um, or after John Boy Jake Radio, I don't have time. What did you see about Davey G- Garcia last night? Uh, Davey Garcia, he, he's, he's, he just, his velocity was down from what I expected. He was only hitting like 91, 92. He, that change up looked like his best pitch, but he only threw one or two of them. His curveball wa- was, was a lollipop loop rainbow. And I don't know. It, it just, you know, it, he's young. He, he's, he, he's young. What happened there, the only thing it shows is that he's not ready yet, but when he's ready, he can still be amazing. Um, I, I, I think 
he got the hype on Davey at the end of last year was way too much. You know, fans do that a lot. Like the hype on um, Chance Adams was ton in 2017. I was trying to tell everyone, like, calm down. You know. But, I mean, I just wish the hype wasn't there because he's clearly not ready, but he he doesn't need to be. Like, he's 21. He he, he hasn't pitched a full season at double A, I don't think. Um, but he's got the stuff, so that's cool. All right, anything else? There's a good chance. There's a good chance the new channel won't be as busy and less fans from a certain base trolling. Yeah, uh, that's true. I mean, I'm hoping that you guys just come come through. That's that's pretty cool, and it'll probably lose some like residual views, but maybe we build it up. And I think that on the new channel, we can do like you know, we can have editors like do montages or like just you know take the Punxsutawney Phil and and cut it into just a three minute clip, and then. Those three-minute clips help fish and find new people on YouTube because the algorithm bullshit, whatever. I don't care. There's a lot going on. But, no, we can do we can do good stuff. And then Jake's going to take over on this channel um, until he builds that up enough, and then we'll keep going and keep going. And, and on the Talking Baseball and Talking Yanks YouTube channels, we're going to start doing the pregame shows, and those are so much fun. We did the Yankees one yesterday. I forgot how much damn fun those are. Uh, so that's cool. Producer Luke should buy an actual ferret and unleash it on BBD. That's cool. Don't bring a ferret into the office, though. That's a hard buck no. All right. I'm out. We got JJR at 10 o'clock. I'm trying to keep these a tidier 30-minute show. We're at 32 minutes. I was late, though. And uh, JJR on John Boy and Jake TV channel at 10 o'clock. Going live, having some fun. What else do we have today? I'll let you know before we leave. Um, record schedule. Whoa, record schedule. Whoa, do, 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 do. you guys like when I show you this stuff? Are you interested? Is there anything I can't show you on here? Mm, no. Here's this week's record schedule. Uh, so today we did morning. End of morning, bam, done. JJR, maybe a watching. We're trying to preload all of those. Talking baseball pregame show that won't be live. We're just doing test episodes that with no audience. Uh, talking baseball season preview. We're recording that today. That's all. Breakdowns, breakdown, breakdown, breakdown. And I believe we have a big meeting at. Actually, I think we have a big meeting at two meeting. Bam, there's a schedule. Now you know. Kind of light. Whoa, what am I doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Kind of light. Usual days like six or seven shows a day. I don't know. Vinny gave two dollars to the BBD desk ferret fund. Appreciate that. Is it take me out this week or next week? Good question. I will find out for you and then I will end the show. Because if you're interested in watching whatever, I appreciate that. Um, oh, you know what? I actually have a Google Sheet that can tell me that. Let me find it. So what was the last uh, watching Friday that came out? Was it Stairway to Stardom? If, if last Friday, okay, hold on. 20th and 24th, this, this Friday's episode is Threes a Crowd. We went back to the Threes a Crowd well on John Boy and Jake TV because we did two, Take Me Out, Stairway to Stardom. They're a little, a little too wholesome, a little too family-friendly, so we had to go back to the grimy world of Threes a Crowd, and it just makes you feel like this. Ugh. It just makes you feel like, oh, my God, everything sucks. But that's it. Um, all right. I'm pivoting the song because I'm, I'm, I am, uh, I shouldn't have done this. This is something I should not have done. I'm not pivoting the song anymore. See you guys. Thanks for hanging out. See you tomorrow.